Greetings and salutations, and welcome to Vesperisms, the art of thinking for yourself. I'm your host, author, illustrator, Vesper Stamper, and this is your regular recalibration of your artistic worldview. So grab your hot beverage of choice and have a seat here in my studio, and let's have a chat. This is season two, episode two, Kintsugi and the Art of Reconciliation. My friend Jeannie once taught me a saying that her mother used to use. It was inspired by growing up during the Great Depression. Use it up, wear it out, make it do or do without. And I have to say, it appeals to my general scrappiness. I'm not someone who holds on to things. I'm not exactly a minimalist, but if you ask my family, I regularly go through my house and I purge redundancies. I don't tend to hold on to sentimental things like Christmas cards or little doodads. Instead, I'm always trying and often failing to pare things down to one item per category that will perfectly fulfill a specific need. Like it would be my dream to own one sweater, one pair of shoes, and some kind of all-purpose knife or leatherman. Oh, and the perfect coffee mug, of course. Ah, it's so elusive. I mean, I've successfully whittled down my watercolor palette to just five colors, my paper down to one brand and finish, my brushes to good Kalinsky sables in three sizes, one type of ink, one brand of drawing pencil, and one brand of black colored pencil. And if you're curious, I'll put that list in the show notes if you feel like geeking out on materials with me. If I was pressed, I could fit this entire studio into one basket or tote bag, and I could fit my entire life into a suitcase. Real life, alas, is not that simple, especially with four people who are not equally committed to my philosophy. Okay, and I do have a weakness for cute frocks, as my closet attests. Oh well. That one thing that I always feel bad at throwing away, though, is broken pottery. Are you with me? Whether it's a cheap bowl or a beloved coffee mug, there's nothing that a little super glue can't fix, right? Except that my skill with those repairs has historically involved stuck fingers and pieces that jutted out because I'd neglected to take the time to truly fit them together right. Well, for a while, I was using Gorilla Glue, which definitely bonds things, but then it expands into this ugly yellow foam. It's totally not the right glue, but it's so handy to have around for more clunky repairs. Like It's like the duct tape of the glue world. But more often what happens is that I just forget and forget and forget to pick up the right glue at the store until I have a collection in the basement of broken vessels that I intend to return to use someday, only to wind up packing them in my next move and opening a box of shards in a new house. Oh yeah, and then I'd add to that box whatever got broken in that move, and then years go by with this box of brokenness just sitting in the basement. Well, a year or two ago, I noticed my painter friend Mako Fujimura posting pictures on Instagram of broken bowls that had been repaired, but with a difference. The cracks in the broken bowls were filled with gold. They were so beautiful. The golden lines drew attention to the repair rather than concealing it. I had seen this kind of thing before, but you know how it is, like when somebody you know starts talking about something, you pay closer attention. This is the Japanese art of kintsugi. Mako told me that he was developing a training program for this practice, and even though I didn't fully understand at the time what kintsugi was, either as an art form or a philosophy, there was something that drew me to it like a magnet. I practically begged him to keep me in mind for the training, and honestly, I don't even know why I was asking him so fervently, but the more he talked about it, the more I could see that this practice had a lot to say to what I was already doing in my illustration, my writing, and my public speaking. And I'll tell you more about that in a minute. But first, what exactly is kintsugi, and where did it come from? Kintsugi is a compound word in Japanese, kin meaning gold, and tsugi meaning repair. It emerges from the traditional Japanese tea ceremony that's also called the way of tea, and from the philosophy of wabi-sabi, both of which were ideas developed into their modern expression by Sen no Rikyu, a Japanese tea master who lived in the 16th century. If you'd like to learn more about Sen no Rikyu, I'll be doing an episode about him on the Makers and Mystics podcast pretty soon, so go subscribe over there and you'll see it when it comes out. Sen no Rikyu felt that his culture was in a state of excess, with ostentatious displays of wealth and jockeying for power. Does that sound familiar? The tradition in his day was to conduct a tea ceremony with the most expensive teaware from China, which was fine, 
porcelain, exquisitely decorated in high detail. Senorikyo instead recentered the tea ceremony on the relationship between the host and the guest. In the simple act of making and receiving and being aware of the natural surroundings instead of covering them up in lavish possessions. And central to his reform was his philosophy of wabi-sabi. Now we've all heard this term bandied about as a design trend and probably read about it on a fashion or a home decorating blog, kind of like the term feng shui. But wabi-sabi is not a style or a fad. It's a centuries-old philosophy. The principle of wabi-sabi goes right to the heart of what it means to be a conscious human in the world. Wabi is a word that's connected to the inner state of things, a quiet aloneness and attentiveness. And sabi speaks of the outer state of objects, especially the beauty of the effect of age on things. It's a way of becoming still and attentive to the way things really are, what's right in front of you. In wabi-sabi philosophy, it's not perfection and wealth that are prized, but a return to nature, simplicity, and the history that's contained within an object. It's an acknowledgement of mortality and decay. Where perfection and wealth seek to hold these at arm's length, wabi-sabi embraces the inevitable and seeks to find beauty in it. Senorikyu restructured the tea ceremony according to wabi-sabi, and instead of a grand palace, the tea was served in a small, humble hut tucked into a natural setting with a low door so that even the most powerful ruler would have to bow to enter. He preferred the humble pottery of Korean peasants to the perfectly detailed and expensive Chinese pottery that was prized at that time. And by simplifying it, he sought to have the tea ceremony become a kind of communion a place of deep honor between both the host and the guest, who had equally important parts to play. Where the host seeks to honor the guest by creating a beautiful cup of matcha for that particular precious individual guest, the guest seeks to honor the host by graciously receiving this gift of grace and care in the form of tea. So where does Kintsugi come to play in all of this? Well, legend has it that Shogun Yoshimasa Ashikaga had a favorite bowl for his tea ceremony, and it broke, and so he sent it back to China to be replaced, but that kind of pottery was no longer being made. So the artisans attempted to repair the bowl instead, but they used metal staples drilled into holes in the pottery. It didn't honor the bowl or its integrity, and so artisans in Japan drew on their work with urushi, or lacquer, to develop a repair technique that allowed the bowl to become even more beautiful than it was before. In the tea ceremony, the guest turns the tea bowl in her hand and really looks at it, taking in its uniqueness before she drinks the tea. The vessel in which the tea is served speaks its own language and tells its own story, and so it becomes part of the connection between the host and the guest. Tea served in a bowl that's been repaired by Kintsugi has an especially unique history to tell. Above all, Kintsugi is not a process to be rushed. Sometimes the practitioner will keep fragments of a piece for a long time until it's time to mend it, even generations. And the repair takes place in stages, namely piecing and gluing the vessel back together, filling cracks and sanding, and finally painting the repair lines with gold or silver, or even other colors of lacquer. It's a simple enough practice, but depending on the repair, each of these stages can take a long time. It forces you to sit with the work, and to sit with the memory of the vessel, and the memory even of the relationship. This simplicity, combined with the precision of the process, allows time to slow down and to experience the act of reconciliation itself, just like real relationship work, which is tedious and takes work and time. In a relationship, in order for true reconciliation to take place, the love and commitment to the relationship outweigh the hard work required to reconcile. The first Kintsugi piece I repaired was a bowl that my mother-in-law gave me. It accidentally broke only a short time after she gave it to me, and I don't remember if I broke it or someone else did, but I repaired it badly with the wrong glue. She and I have a bit of a fraught relationship when it comes to gift giving, and I know that sometimes my reactions have been hurtful to her over the two decades that we've been family. And so my first question in my training was, should I re-break this bowl so that I can glue it back properly? 
And I was told that no, the repair that I attempted is part of the history of that vessel. I was surprised. So this wasn't as much about erasing the messiness as much as accepting the history. It wasn't about perfection. It was about truth. So I used putty to fill the large gaps and bring back integrity to the vessel. And as I patiently formed and then sanded the putty, I was forced to confront the ways that I've hurt my mother-in-law and to forgive and extend grace to her in my heart for the way that she's hurt me. My heart softened toward her as a result, and the bowl now resides prominently in my dining room instead of being hid away in the corner out of embarrassment. The other piece that I repaired in my training was a small orange Japanese teacup painted with gold. And I bought that cup on the day that my grandfather died before I got the call to come to the hospital to say goodbye. It broke in one of my many moves, but it held such a deep memory of him that I could never throw it out. And I've had it for 18 years since he passed away. The repair of gold integrated with the gold lines that were already on the cup. And they allowed me to honor him once more, thinking of how precious and important my grandfather was to me. One repair of many that I'm working on right now is a small Japanese saucer that belonged to my grandmother. I remember it propped up on a shelf in her kitchen back when I could rest in the safety of her house in the midst of a tumultuous childhood. My grandmother's now in a home for dementia care, and my daughter accidentally broke this dish, but instead of being devastated about it, I thought, ah, there's kintsugi. <laughs> Repairing the dish right now is a way for me to make peace with the growing distance between my grandmother and I, and to honor our past and to prepare for the inevitable future. When I go into schools as a visiting author, a lot of what I do is showing students examples from history about how everyday people react in extraordinary times for good and ill. When we lose our consciousness of things like love of neighbor, personal integrity, and allowing others to have freedom of their speech and of their conscience, we can find ourselves committing acts we never imagined. Maybe those students have been victims of abuse or other trauma. Rarely are we truly taught that not only are we able to recover from trauma, but that we can integrate our past into our total life story, building resilience for the present and the future. We can choose to become people who steel ourselves against fragmentation in ourselves, in our neighbors, and in our societies. This is ultimately why I wanted to learn Kintsugi. It's such a vivid example of this kind of redemptive message. We can first of all learn to allow our own wounds to be bound up in love. We can forgive and reconcile and we can share that resilience that we gain. We can rehumanize each other through Kintsugi, this slow intentional process that mimics the slow intentionality of reconciliation. So what are some deeper meanings within the practice of Kintsugi and what can it mean for us now? There are a lot of words being thrown around in my country at the moment, things like culture war, banning, disenfranchisement, vengeance, consequences, secession, even civil war. It's a time of violence, both physical and rhetorical. Another one of those words that we throw about is sustainable. And as much as we say that we value sustainability, in our culture, there are many things that we still view as disposable, from paper goods to batteries to cell phones. But we have also created disposable people. I've said it before, 2020 could have been our chance to come together in solidarity over our common suffering. But we screwed it up. All of us. Every single one of us has participated in the fragmentation of our society. All of our leaders ham-handedly bungled the response to one disease and sent millions teetering into other diseases, including ones of mental health. A recent Gallup survey showed that depression and anxiety disorders have skyrocketed just over the last year, and that's over and above an already existing mental health crisis. As a historical fiction novelist, I see us repeating dangerous patterns built on group division and collective guilt that I promise you are leading nowhere good. 
The parts of history that we vow never to acknowledge, our personal history, our family history, our national or world history, instead of becoming new scar tissue that makes us stronger right in the place of the wound, they fester, never healing, allowing disease and infection to come in and poison us. I feel it daily, right in my own body. Part of what I feel called to do is to make work for my readers and viewers so they don't have to delve into the darkness as deeply as I do. I try to metabolize those dark things and deliver only what's salient in the form not of a news report or an academic analysis, but of a story about people and a story with pictures. And, and in the process of this work, sometimes it feels like the world, the entire world, the past, the present, and the future, and other people's emotions and turmoil are constantly crisscrossing through my body and my mind as though I was a toll bridge. And I feel fractures grow in the foundations of that bridge. I feel it grow in myself. And I need repair and restoration after days months and years of putting myself into those places for the sake of my readers. I need repair. So how do I do it? There are a lot of things that I do, but one of the ways is by practicing Kintsugi. Kintsugi necessitates slowing down, appreciating the small, the precision of fitting pieces back together well so that the whole vessel maintains and strengthens its integrity. Kintsugi means accepting and even celebrating imperfection, not hiding our fractures and flaws. Kintsugi master Kunio Nakamura says that in Kintsugi, we are creating not a repair, but a landscape, a series of rivers and tree branches, and we see the picture created by the cracks themselves. Kintsugi honors the vessel, yes, but it also honors the person connected to it. Maybe the vessel was a gift given by someone special, maybe someone who's no longer in my life. Maybe the vessel belonged to a loved one and it makes me smile to hold it whole in my hands again. Kintsugi is an enactment of redemption. Again, the repair is not meant to return the vessel to its former perfection, but instead we are mending to make new. As Mako Fujimura says, even trauma mended becomes something new. It can become an initial act of reconciliation, preparing me for a difficult conversation with someone with whom my relationship is fractured. In fact, like a restored relationship, the vessel mended by Kintsugi becomes more valuable for what it's suffered. What if we were to look at our current world and recognize it for what it is and not what we would wish it to be? to accept its brokenness. And what if we could respond not in rage, but in hope? And what if we could determine to bring beauty into the brokenness, to begin to pour in the gold of peacemaking, of love, and of seeing people as individuals imbued with glory? So often as artists, myself included, we see ourselves as clenched fists communicating to power. We narrow the power of art into a tool to combat the power of injustice. It's like two superheroes flying up into the stratosphere to clash in a supernova of good triumphing over evil. This is the nature of what we call the culture wars. But what if instead of closing down into a clenched fist, the artist saw himself or herself as an open hand, as a witness of possibility, one who lays out new landscapes, rivers and trees in the midst of dark valleys, a new creation born out of a broken world. Thanks for joining me for this week's Vesperisms. If you're interested in having me lead a Kintsugi workshop for your school, your religious or cultural institution, either in person or virtually, please contact me through my website. It's vesperillustration.com forward slash contact. I can walk you through the process of having me teach this beautiful and meaningful art to your group. And I want to say a special thanks to Kintsugi Academy for bringing me and others into this special way of practicing this work of reconciliation. 
I'm happy to announce that Vesperisms is now on Patreon. So if you've found value in this episode, would you consider supporting what I'm doing? A contribution of any size helps me to set aside the time to create these episodes for you. The link to that is in the show notes, or you can look for Vesperisms on patreon.com. By all means, would you leave me a five-star review on iTunes and subscribe to my YouTube channel? That'll help others to find this podcast and to spread the message of an artistic worldview to more people. You can follow me on Instagram at Vesper Illustration and subscribe to my newsletter at VesperIllustration.com to get news about my work and a free outtake chapter from my latest book, A Cloud of Outrageous Blue. You can buy my books wherever you love to buy books, and please, always, Ask at your local independent bookstore first. And when you've read my books, would you please do me the great honor of leaving a review on Amazon? That helps me as an author immensely. You have no idea. Music for Vesperisms is, as always, provided by Ben and Vesper, and that's my band. My friend, no matter what fractures remain to be mended in your life, your voice is important, and you don't have to have it all repaired before you use your voice. What you say and what you do matters. And just remember, work isn't everything, but everything is the work. See you next time.